It's Friday, January the 10th, 2014. I'm Mark Chatterley, and this is episode number 16 of TEN, Transport Evolved News for the week beginning January the 6th, 2014. On with the show. It could be argued that of all the mainstream manufacturers, Renault is the one with the most commitment to electric vehicles. After all, they do have four separate electrically powered vehicles on the market. Or do they? This week, it was confirmed to Transport Evolve that the European production of the Fluence, the all-electric sedan, ended in November 2012 for good. The Fluence was the car made for battery swapping, quite literally. It was the car made for better place. And it seems with that company going under, Renault didn't see a future for that car in their ZE range. That's zero emissions range. However, if you're a fan of the car, it's not all bad news. In October last year, the Samsung SM3ZE, basically a rebadged version of the car, went into production in South Korea. This version of the car even comes with a 43 kilowatt chameleon charger that's found in the Renault Zoe. The big upside to all this for people in the EU is that there are some cracking deals on secondhand fluences to be had if you want a cheap EV or fancy doing some DIY upgrades. So, you know, go shopping. Following in the footsteps of many other manufacturers like Nissan, Renault and BMW to name a few, Volkswagen's offering German customers who buy the upcoming E-Up 30 days of free ICE car hire. 30 days is a nice step up from other manufacturers, whereas Nissan offers 14 days or 2,000 miles and BMW offers a weird point system based upon what you borrow and for how long. So 30 days is pretty good. The E-Up does have a fairly short range, just 93 miles in the NEDC test cycle. This will work out at around 60 miles of real-world usage, according to my back-of-the-envelope calculations. But what's wonderful about this scheme, though, is that it allows people to own just one city car and then rent a car for those longer trips. I can actually see a potential market here for shorter range EVs with free rental, especially if that rental gets me one of those fuel efficient VW blue motion cars, or say a go in one of those 100,000 euro XL1s. That'd be pretty sweet. London's black cabs are known the world over, and it's not just the cabs that are famous. So are the drivers who have to take the knowledge, a test to make sure they know every street in London and how to come up with the quickest route from one to another. But the black cab has never had a very eco image, even with all the improvements of late. So enter Nissan. From later this year, the Hackney carriages are getting a refresh, courtesy of the specially designed variant of Nissan's NV200 minivan, which was officially unveiled by Nissan earlier this week. Initially, the power will come courtesy of a 1.6 litre diesel engine, but from 2015, Nissan says an all-electric, zero-emissions version will be on streets too. So in future, when you hail a cab in London, you know you'll be driven around in a quiet, smooth EV. Yeah. If you're a bit of a geek like me, you'll know all about Bletchley Park. It was the UK's super top secret code breaking base. It's where the Enigma code was finally broken by a team under the leadership of Alan Turing, one of my personal heroes. But the nearest city to Bletchley Park, Milton Keynes, is now trying to get its name on the geek map too by rolling out electric buses that charge wirelessly. The buses will operate on the number seven route, which covers 15 miles between the suburbs of Wolverton and Bletchley. Travelling nearly 50,000 miles a year, each bus will need to be able to hold its own against any traditionally powered bus. With overnight charges being supplemented by wireless opportunity charging at the beginning and end of its route, the bus shouldn't have any problems. Or so we're told. It's a brilliant idea and a wonderful scheme, and we can't wait to see how it gets on throughout the year. So we're thinking a trip to Milton Keynes might be in order. Come on, Nikki, let's get going. Volvo has previously said it plans to achieve a 100% zero emissions fleet by 2020, but for now it's chosen to marry its all new range of lightweight, turbocharged, four cylinder gasoline and diesel engines with a plug in drivetrain as an interim measure. It makes sense as it gets their customers used to a plug before going fully electric. In a few days' time, Volvo will unveil the second of three promised plug in concept vehicles at the 2014 North American International Auto Show in Detroit. Called the Volvo Concept XC Coupe SUV, this second concept vehicle continues to pave the way for Volvo's all-new scalable product architecture vehicle platform and serves as a great hint at what Volvo has planned for the next generation XC90, due to be unveiled later this year. Unlike the current production XC90 SUV, the Concept XC Coupe is a three-door mirroring the three-door form factor of Volvo's plug-in concept coupe. It looks nice! Not my cup of tea, but I could see plenty of people wanting one. Volvo hasn't yet taught specifics when it comes to engine, motor or battery pack specifications, but at this stage it's still just a concept. 
We look forward to finding out more as time goes on and seeing what the final design looks like. Japanese automaker Toyota chose CES 2014 as the place to promote its commitment to hydrogen fuel cell technology by opening the show with two hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. A FCV concept four-door sedan and a fully camouflaged prototype car it says has been undergoing extensive testing for more than a year. Alongside this, Toyota eagerly promising it will launch its first mass-produced hydrogen fuel cell car for customers to buy by the end of next year, along with a sponsored refueling infrastructure. Toyota has been working hard with the University of California Iovine's Advanced Power and Energy program to figure out the best places in California for the locations of the refueling stations for the hydrogen cars. The assumption is that owners want to be able to reach a fueling station within six minutes. The estimated cost for these stations is more than one and a quarter million dollars each, and Toyota has earmarked the money for a hundred of these stations and plans to have them running by 2024. I am a bit of a hydrogen skeptic, so it's going to be really interesting to see how this one pans out. Let's see what you got, Toyota. The 2014 model year Leaf was announced in the US this week, with very few changes from last year. Aside from the $180 price increase across the board on last year's models, there are really only two additions. The backup camera is now a standard option, and the car can now be bought in a new colour! Woo! One interesting change is the EPA rated range, which has increased from 75 miles to 84 miles. But don't get excited yet. The car can't actually go any further. Nissan have just removed the option to charge to 80% rather than 100. As the EPA mixes the results of the standard 80% charge and 100% charge on cars that support it, by removing the option to charge to 80%, the EPA only had the 100% figure to go on. Quite cheeky, really. The big question is, would Nissan remove this setting just to get a better EPA mileage figure if they knew it was going to be worse on the battery? Or to put it another way, is Nissan now endorsing the idea that charging to 100% all the time is as good for the battery as the old recommendation of an 80% charge for longevity? We'll have to see how this one goes. It has been confirmed this week in a statement from BMW that the i3 with range extender will not be eligible for the Californian HOV white sticker. This goes against the initial expectation from BMW that they would be able to configure the car in such a way that they'd get the sticker. This would have made it the only car with a range extender to be able to do this. The i3 Rex still qualifies for the Californian tax rebate and will also be able to apply for the limited number green stickers, but they're given out on a first come first serve basis and there aren't a huge amount left. So if you want an i3 with range extender and want to take it in the HOV lanes in California, you best get in there quick. A Stanford University spin-out company called Amperis has been perfecting a new type of silicon-based lithium-ion battery pack, which could not only pave the way for gadgets to last longer between charges, but also plug-in cars that could go hundreds of miles between recharges. At the heart of Amperis's battery technology is an anode made of silicon instead of the carbon traditionally used for anode material in lithium-ion batteries. Much higher in its potential energy density than carbon, due to its surface structure, building electrodes from silicon has always been viewed as the holy grail of battery chemistry. But because of the way that silicon expands under lithium-ion insertion, however, making silicon-based lithium-ion batteries that can withstand the repeated abuse of thousands of charge and discharge cycles has historically been a challenge. Amperis says it has a solution. By turning silicon into ultra-thin nanowires using chemical vapour disposition, it's able to produce silicon nanowire electrodes that are not only capable of storing a large amount of energy, but also strong enough to withstand the stresses and strains of repeated charge-discharge cycles. The company still has a long way to go to prove this technology can work on an industrial scale, but they have also a lot of investors very interested in what they are doing. Fingers crossed for positive results. And finally, this week Gizmodo posted the story about a 3D printed wind turbine that can be used to generate power. Very interesting you say. And I'd agree, 3D printing is cool. But we think that maybe some of Gizmodo's staff writers need to go back to school as they started suggesting that these turbines could be placed on the top of EVs to extend their range or even help them drive forever. Yeah, no, that's not how it works. It seems that Gizmodo's staff is confusing wind, which is air moving on its own, with air rushing past a car as the car propels itself along a road. I suppose it's an easy mistake. No, it's, it's not. It's really not. Basically, this all comes down to two things. The laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy. So, thanks Gizmodo for giving me and Nikki a brilliant laugh this week, but yeah, you need to learn a bit more. Sorry. 
That's it for this week. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode of TEN. In the meantime, visit www.transportevolve.com for all the EV news that's fit to print, subscribe to our channel and other shows on YouTube, and join us live on Sunday where we'll be discussing these stories and others on Transport Evolved. Until next time, stay juiced up! Right, and just because I know someone's going to ask me to do this, if I don't do this, I'm going to do it anyway. Scissors cuts paper. Paper covers rock. Rock crushes lizard. Lizard poisons Spock. Spock smashes scissors. Scissors decapitates lizard. Lizard eats paper. Paper disproves Spock. Spock vaporizes rock. Rock crushes scissors. Done.